All right, welcome everyone. We're so delighted to have everyone join us today. We're very excited to introduce the second seminar in our series on confronting environmental racism and promoting environmental justice. This series is a, an, an embedded series within the larger IHSC core webinar series, and it's organized by the Community Engagement Corps, the Stakeholder Advocacy Board, and the Integrated Health Science Corps of the MLEAD Center. Um, this series is also co-sponsored by the Environmental Health Sciences Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee and the Health Behavior, Health Education, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Collaborative. So welcome everyone, delighted to have you join us. I am, um, I also, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement um, and to acknowledge, to recognize that the University of Michigan and all of the work that we're doing here today in these presentations are made possible um, by a land grant, the sale of lands that were ceded by the Anishinaabe, um, the Fox, uh, the Peoria, and the Wyandotte. Almost all property in the United States was obtained through measures that were less than honorable. Um, including threat of violence or actual violence, deception, and or failure to honor treaties. Um, and understanding and acknowledging the history of genocide and sub settler colonialism that underlies contemporary inequities, including contemporary health inequities, can create a foundation for applying our research, teaching, and practice to create a more just and equitable future. This series focuses on environmental racism and environmental justice. Um, environmental racism is the di disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on people of color. And I just included these two maps as one illustration of what that can look like. The map on the left shows exposure to diesel PM, uh, cancer and respiratory risks that are directly attributable to air pollution in the Detroit metropolitan area. Detroit is outlined in black on that slide, and it's surrounded by the tri-counties of Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb. And you can see the distribution um, of the red, um, darkest red shows the highest risk of air pollution, and increasingly lighter colors show lower risk of air pollution. Juxtaposed against that is the map on the right, which shows the distribution of people of color, and I think visually makes the point that people of color in the Detroit metropolitan area experience uh, disproportionate uh, exposure. I also want to um, recognize um, and acknowledge uh, Peter Hammer, who did a wonderful presentation yesterday and was the inspiration for this slide, um, reminding us of the structural nature of the inequities that we see um, shown in the two slides on the right here. There's a long history that that uh, set the stage for the, the kind of inequities that we see here. Um, the slide on the, on the left is a redlining map of Detroit um, that was created in the 1940s, and you can see visually how the red areas and the yellow areas, which are considered the, the areas that were more marginal um, for uh, home loans, um, you can see how those map onto the contemporary landscape of environmental exposures air to air pollution. So environmental justice is the environmental justice, it's a movement's response to environmental racism. It's defined as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, this goal will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process. And I want to highlight that second piece. We often think of environmental justice as an outcome where there's the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards, but equally important to definitions of environmental justice are the meaningful and equitable involvement, um, in particular, of those who experience disproportionate environmental risks in the decision-making process and in the rulemaking process. I'm really delighted to introduce our panel today, which is who are going to be talking about water and health. The timing is perfect. Yesterday was World Water Day, um, and we're really 
uh, fortunate to have this superstar team uh, presenting for us today. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, first um, Monica Lewis-Patrick, who is a member, we're fortunate to have her as a member of our Stakeholder Advocacy Board for the MLEAD Center. She is an educator, an entrepreneur, and a human rights advocate, and a founding member of We the People of Detroit, where she currently serves as CEO and is at the forefront of water justice struggles in Michigan and globally. Co-presenting with her today, um, are Nadia Gaber, um, who is a member of We the People in, in Detro of Detroit, um, and uh, she received her PhD from the Joint Program in Medical Anthropology um, from UCSF and UC Berkeley, and is in the process um, of obtaining her MD degree at UCSF. She's a proud member of We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective, the Critical Resistance Oakland Power Projects, and the UCSF Climate Psychiatry Working Group. And uh, our third presenter today is Emily Kuto, who is an assistant professor of architecture at Lawrence Tech uh, University. She's also a founding member of We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective, a collaboration between community activists, academics, and designers mapping geographies of austerity in Detroit. She also co coordinates a project called the Black Bottom Street View, which is an immersive representation of, of historic Detroit neighborhoods destroyed by um, urban renewal. And I am going to take down my slides and turn it over to our incredible team of presenters. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy Schultz. It's been just an honor and a privilege to work with you. I can't say enough about how much we have learned at this table and how critical your voice and your leadership, along with many uh, within the advisory table, uh, what you your efforts have done to advance the human right to water, not only in Michigan, but we believe across the nation. So just once again, want to thank the table for all the amazing work, especially during this uh, current crisis of COVID and lack of water access. But I'm not going to take up a much, uh, much of your time. I want to really defer at this moment uh, to the exceptional work that's been led uh, at We the People of Detroit through the Community Research Collective uh, by Dr. Nadia Gaber. I refer to her as Dr. Doctor and the amazing designer and visual uh, mastermind at We the People of Detroit, uh, the great Professor Emily Kudo. So ladies, take it away. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, does that look okay? Mm -hmm. Looks great. great. Okay, great, thanks. And thank you so much for Monica for the introduction and Amy for the introduction as well. Um, and I just want to you know, thank you for inviting us to talk with you today. Um, this is always such a great opportunity to connect with folks working in different spaces on these issues. Um, so um, Monica, Nadia, and I are here today um, representing We the People of Detroit and our Community Research Collective, um, which, as Monica said, is dedicated to community coalition building and to providing resources that inform, train, and mobilize the citizens of Detroit. Um, and here's a kind of outline of how we're going to move through the presentations today. So Nadia and I are going to kind of bounce back and forth and talk about um, different aspects of the research related to public health and water. Um, and so we're going to start um, initially, oh, um, we're, we're going to start um, by talking about the ways that our water affordability crisis is, is a public health crisis on a tremendous scale. Um, and this crisis has major consequences for the safety and the stability of our communities. A recent study by Michigan State University researcher Elizabeth Mack found that over a third of Americans were at risk of losing access to affordable drinking water by 2022. And this research was done before the pandemic. Um, so it's only been tremendously exacerbated by everything that's happened since then. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, states across the country stopped shutting off water acknowledging that access to running water is a fundamental public health necessity. Given this recent acknowledgement of the critical link between affordable water and public health, we are really right now in a critical moment to move policy at the local, state, and national levels towards water affordability. In the past 10 years, about 170,000 families have had their water shut off in Detroit. 
Based on our analysis of the water department's shutoff data, between 2010 and 2017, we estimate that somewhere between 10 and 40 percent of the city's population, or between 63,000 and 270,000 people, have had the city shut off their water during this time. This practice puts the health of the entire city at risk. I'm going to give a little bit of context about our water system first, um, and then we'll talk more about our public health research. Um, so first, we need to talk about the fact that Detroit has a vast regional water system. It's one of the largest water and wastewater systems in the world. Um, and this water system has developed over a period of over 100 years, um, and thus it contains countless lead soldered pipes and lead service lines. The city of Detroit built, maintained, and operated the regional system for 100 years as the water system expanded to facilitate and subsidize the growth of Detroit's suburbs. For our system's entire existence, it has been the center of a power struggle between the suburbs and the city, fueled by segregation and racism. Emergency managers catalyzed both the Detroit and Flint water crises. Mass water shutoffs began under an emergency manager in Detroit, and Flint was removed from Detroit's water system and poisoned under an emergency manager in Flint. So here what you're seeing is a timeline of water shutoffs um, from 2010 to 2015, kind of captures the period at which mass water shutoffs really became amplified in Detroit. Um, and you can see that this is the same time period when Flint was under emergency management, um, right after emergency manager of Detroit, Kevin Orr, declares bankruptcy on behalf of the city, water shutoffs skyrocket. Um, and so we've seen this pattern basically of these kind of extreme increases in water shutoffs every summer since then. Flint was Detroit's largest wholesale customer. Its removal from Detroit's system um, during, and you can see that here um, in April 2014, weakened Detroit's finances and helped justify the transfer of control to the Great Lakes Water Authority, which has majority suburban leadership. Emergency managers have the power to override all local elected officials in Michigan. This practice has been used to usurp locally elected governments and majority black cities across the state. And so on the left, you see a map of um, municipalities that have been under an emergency management or a consent agreement, which is essentially a light form of emergency management. Um, and we were looking that in, in, in relationship to racial demographics. So the purple dots that you see there um, represent African-American people, um, the yellow dots represent white people, and the, the orange dots represent other races and ethnicities. Um, on the right side, you can see an illustration of the change in control over the water department when the water department transitioned to the Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, so on, on the upper map, you can see the city of Detroit right, is, is selling water to the surrounding communities. There is a board of water commissioners which has majority representation by the city of Detroit. After that, that uh, control of the regional water system is transferred to the Great Lakes Water Authority, we, the city of Detroit uh, has minority representation on the board, um, and the majority representation is allocated to the surrounding suburban communities. Um, and so you can really sort of see this in context of this long sort of struggle over control um, of the regional system. In 2016, we worked with researchers from Henry Ford Health Systems to do a pilot study on the relationship between water shutoffs and water-related illnesses. So we were looking um, particularly at skin and soft tissue diseases and gastrointestinal illnesses. Our research showed that people who were diagnosed with water-related illnesses were 1.48 times more likely to live on a block with water shutoffs. We found that the inverse is also true, that people who live on blocks with water shutoffs were 1.55 times more likely to get a water-related illness. And, you know, we see this also, and I don't know if Nadia maybe has something to add about this, um, we see this also in context with the rise of other waterborne um, contamination. And so this is research that was done by um, George Gaines, um, who was tracking the um, increase in diseases um, like Campylobacter, Shigellosis, um, Giardiasis. I am not a health researcher, as you can see. Um, and so we see all of these increases in these water-related illnesses um, sort of mapping onto the timeline of um, mass water shutoffs in the city. 
Yeah. So thank you. So we, I kind of joined the community research collective as the snapping the water crisis research was underway and all of those maps that um, Emily just showed and Monica um, set up were from this book mapping the water crisis um, that was responding to a lot of the misinformation and the misnarratives about why Detroiters were having their water shut off and not connecting it to um, these structural, uh, the power dynamics, the fight um, between the suburbs and the city that Emily mentioned, and the racial demographics of who it was affecting. And then there was also this question of, well, how does this impact health? Obviously, we know that water is a vital resource um, for health, and that historically, it's the source of most infectious disease. And um, as Emily just showed you, George Gaines, who was a former deputy director of the Detroit Health Department, had shown that you have a rise of otherwise quite rare um, infectious diseases, a resurgence of them in, in and around Detroit at the time of the water shutoffs. Um, so Emily, if you'd go to the next slide. So what we did was take our um, community members and volunteers and actually use the public health tools that were in the public domain that weren't being used for our local public health department, which had sort of divested itself from the responsibility of tracking the health impacts of the water shutoffs. So we went to the CDC's website and found this toolkit that allows you to do public health impact assessment in the wake of a disaster. And um, while this might not be a conventional national natural disaster. Um, this was a disaster spreading through the city. And so um, essentially, it's a random sampling of across the entire city of Detroit. We knocked on more than 700 doors. And here you can see um, the yellow dots are the blocks that we ended up sampling um, using this weighted sample. And um, the it's overlaid on an image that shows um, the, the shutoffs, um, where the kind of darker color is the more um, dense concentration of shutoffs. So as you can see, we looked at neighborhoods with high, medium, and low prevalence of shutoffs so that you know this was a, a representative sample. And we knew that we'd have to do this to avoid um, biased um, allegations, even though it was a massive undertaking. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, we found um, at the same time, there was a county health um, authority health that put out a recommendation that people who are especially vulnerable should be protected from water shutoffs. So they said seniors who are 62 and above, people with living with mental illness or disabilities, expectant or breastfeeding mothers, people dealing with chronic illnesses, and people otherwise in need of critical medical care should have protections to keep their water on. And when we did this survey, um, we found that more than 82% of households in the city of Detroit would be ineligible for shutoffs based on health exemption criteria alone. So it just speaks to the very um, high structural vulnerability um, that already existed in the city of Detroit before these water shutoffs were imposed. So then we did a closer look. We, we did another study and a survey be, um, because one of the things in that disaster toolkit asks about emotional symptoms like agitation, trouble sleeping, nightmares, depression, anxiety. And we wanted to um, now look closer and see if those were actually related to water shutoffs or if they were, um, you know, um, if, if we could kind of um, correlate them to water insecurity specifically. So um, we worked to design a locally grounded scale of water insecurity that reflected what water insecurity actually looked like in the communities that we study. And um, we found that 26% um, um, of Detroit residents said that they were always or usually stressed about affording their uh, water bills and that the average length of time that residents were without water was 10 and a half days. Now, at the time, the Detroit Water and Sewage Department was saying that people were off for no more than 24 hours. Um, they were saying this was just a tool that they were using to get customers to come into the department and reactivate their accounts. But it, we, we talked to people who had been living in their homes for um, three plus months without running water and finding other ways of getting water and making it work. So um, this was really, um, I think, important um, to reflect what the community knew what was actually going on as opposed to what the water department was saying was going on. So this is just um, a photo of the food pantry where um, we did our survey in um, collaboration with the pastor and organizer of the um, Brightmore Connection Food Pantry. And as you can see, uh, half of that pantry um, was bottled water because so many families were in need that they um, ended up adding water as part of their um, essential food distribution. 
Um, and then, you know, these are just from the paper that we ultimately ended up publishing, showing that, yes, we were able to um, statistically correlate um, having uh, water shut off to increased incidence of psychosocial distress. So if you had a shut off, then you were 2.3, it was a 2.3 point increase in this five point scale of psychosocial distress. Um, so Essentially, this is just a way of, um, again, like statistically correlating this specifically to water insecurity. And we believe it's the first study that's actually looked at um, measuring and quantifying water insecurity in the US. We also found relationships that you know weren't large enough to do statistical analysis on, but certainly speak to the condition that people are living in. So among these residents um, who we asked, you know, since the water shutoffs began, have you drank water that you thought might be unsafe for your health? More than 80% said yes. Um, more than 75% of people were worried they wouldn't have enough water to meet their basic needs or borrowed and shared water with a neighbor, friend, or relative. Um, and over a third said that they collected water from an undesirable or dirty source. And so most recently, um, this past year, we did some kind of um, really, really fast turnaround research um, looking at the relationship between COVID-19 and water shutoffs. Um, and so we're actually working on publishing this work right now. Um, First, we looked at parts of the city that were most impacted by water shutoffs. And so you see this map earlier in the presentation, which really shows that you know on the on the far east side and the far west side of the city, those are really the areas with um, the greatest burden of water shutoffs. Um, and we're showing it two ways. We're showing it both in terms of the number of shutoffs um, and in terms of the rate, so controlling for population size. Um, and that's mostly to capture that Southwest Detroit is also um, impacted by shutoffs, but has a low population. Um, and so we we will sort of overlay these outlines on the following maps to talk about how these things are all interrelated. Um, so Nadia talked about you know, the, the sort of heightened degree of structural um, vulnerability to um, health impacts from water shutoffs in the city. Um, and so the first thing that we did was map um, some of those structural vulnerabilities that we were able to map. Um, and so on the left, you're seeing a map of the number of households with children. Um, on the right, you're seeing number of residents over age 65. Um, and you can see that both of those populations are really concentrated in the same parts of the city where we see the greatest burden from water shutoffs. And I wanna really highlight here the Northwest side of the city where you see a really large number of residents over age 65. Um, so then what we did was we looked at how COVID played out when it first hit the city. And this was really immediate research that we did in June of 2020. Um, we were trying to capture this sort of as it was happening. Um, and so this is a kind of snapshot of what things looked like in June, um, sort of from the beginning of the pandemic until June. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of explain what you're seeing here in these two maps. Um, on the left side, what you're seeing is the rate of COVID-19 cases per zip code. Um, so this is right controlled for population, showing that there were a high rate of, of COVID cases, both in the near east side of the city and also on the northwest side of the city. Um, and you can see that that also maps onto the locations of nursing homes. So all those yellow pins that we have on the map and the numbers associated with them are where there were outbreaks inside of nursing homes in the city. Um, and so, you know, when you just look at the rate, you can see that it's basically an illustration of where nursing homes are located. Um, on the right side, on the right map, what we're mapping is actually the number of COVID cases per zip code. Um, and you can see that there was a much higher volume of cases um, in the on the northwest side of the city. So the darkest green area had uh, 1,042 cases by June of 2020. Whereas on the on the near east side of the city, there were 495. So twice as many twice as many COVID cases um, in that one zip code on the northwest side of the city. The other thing that we're mapping on this map is the percentage of those cases that are connected to nursing homes. 
And the reason we did this is because we were really trying to understand, you know, if there was a relationship between water shutoffs and COVID cases, we know that there aren't water shutoffs happening inside of nursing homes. And so we were really interested in kind of controlling for that and looking at what's happening out in the neighborhoods outside of these kinds of facilities. And what we found is on the near east side of the city, almost half of the cases occurred within nursing homes. Whereas, you know, when you look on the west side of the city, you can see a much smaller percentage of the total number of cases happen in nursing homes, which means that those cases are happening out in the community where people live. Um, and so that was really our kind of area of greatest concern for understanding this potential relationship between water shutoffs. And what you can see here is that there's a really strong relationship between the concentration of cases, the areas of the city that are most impacted by shutoffs, and additionally, the areas of the city where we have the greatest number of residents over age 65. And so those, all of those things really overlap on the northwest side of the city. So what can we learn from this research? We can't prove that water shutoffs are causing an increase in COVID cases. It's not a causal relationship that we're proving, um, but it does show that water shutoffs are disproportionately impacting elderly people and families in Detroit. We can see that the largest COVID outbreak in the city in terms of number of cases happened on the west side, right in the center of the shutoffs. So this practice of mass water shutoffs is incredibly dangerous, putting our most vulnerable population in the city at risk in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we are currently in a shutoff moratorium, um, but that moratorium is set to expire um, this month, I believe. Um, and so we really need to work on a more sustainable solution um, to ensure that residents in Detroit and residents all over the state of Michigan have affordable access to safe water. Um, and we also know that, you know, public health is not something that stays within a zip code, right? It is something that affects our entire region. And so in order to protect the health of our entire region, we really have to protect the health of those most vulnerable. So the next set of slides just um, kind of help us understand, as I think we've all been forced to over the um, past year, how um, the pandemic shows us the existing um, disparities um, that are only exacerbated by coronavirus um, and as well as water shutoffs. So we knew that um, coronavirus, both cases and deaths, disproportionately affect African Americans. And at the beginning of this pandemic, as the research came through, actually Michigan had the highest um, racial disparities in both case rates and deaths of any state um, when it came to coronavirus. Um, one of the things that I think speaks to the absence of data is that um, initially states weren't collecting race, racial and ethnicity data on COVID-19. Again, we were under a different administration and there was lots to do with the politics of um, collecting and reporting information, this kind of idea of if you don't test, then the numbers won't rise. Well, again, I think there was an idea of if you don't report this information, it made it very difficult um, to understand who was being the most um, disproportionately affected. And so it took a lot of local advocacy to make that data public, very similar to what we faced in trying to get the Department of Water and Sewerage in Detroit to release shutoff data um, and to do so with enough information that we can do this kind of research um, because data uh, is part of, um, it's it's a public good as well. And it's part of um, the transparency that our public agencies are, are required to um, share. So um, this is just a, a graph that shows that those pre-existing conditions that predispose people to worse outcomes from COVID, asthma, diabetes, um, former heart attack, um, were disproportionately in communities of color um, particularly in Black communities and in Native American communities. The next one, this shows though, um, and I thought this was important, that although that narrative I think explained or explained away a lot of the racial disparities in COVID-19 deaths, actually the largest disparities in death rates occurred in young people who were 35 to 44 years old. And that, at least to my knowledge, has yet to be explained adequately. Um, and so I think that they uh, that there are other issues of structural racism, of inequitable access to health care that are not explained by the simple narrative that people who have more pre-existing conditions um, suffered worse fates um, in terms of COVID-19. And finally, this just um, shows both disparities in access to insurance um, and also who, even among those who did have insurance, um, that there are racial disparities in those who would even choose to see a doctor um, because of cost. 
and again, um, a study from the Kaiser Foundation, the same study, um, showing the share of non-elderly adults who re reported um, financial concerns in terms of paying their monthly bills, their rent, their mortgage, their housing. Um, and I think that we understand that the U.S. Um, cities in the U.S. and people living in cities face extreme housing crisis and rising costs. And the water crisis is, I think, an invisible part of what's driving a lot of that housing crisis. Um, and the statistic Emily began with that over a third of US households will be unable to afford their water just in the coming year or two. That is not being talked about enough as one of the drivers of housing um, inequality um, in this country. And it is one of those monthly payments that everyone has to meet and just isn't able to. The cost of water has risen faster than the pace of inflation um, and has skyrocketed more than 80% just in the last decade. So we know from um, this early study that came out during COVID-19 of um, infection rates on American Indian reservations in Oklahoma that the number one correlate of um, the rate of infection was whether people had access to adequate indoor plumbing. So potable water was a key determinant of, um, of health in regards to the pandemic um, in American Indian reservations in particular, but also we believe in major cities. And then this graph just zooms us out to a little bit of a global perspective. Um, this was a study done just at the beginning, uh, published just as the pandemic was rolling through at the end of 2019, that showed the percent of people around the world who reported they were unable to wash their hands um, in the last 30 days. So water insecurity remains a major global challenge. It's one of the most fundamental um, anti-poverty initiatives and health initi public health initiatives that we could do. And yet we still have, in some places, more than 60% of people um, cannot wash their hands regularly. So you can imagine how much water insecurity has been a driver of this pandemic, um, especially given that vaccines won't become available um, in many countries around the world for years to come. And then finally, kind of coming back to the US, here's some um, quotes from both our Surgeon General and a state senator about, you know, what was what what was the messaging around COVID-19? So the Surgeon General said um, specifically to communities of color, you know, avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs and call your friends and families, check in on your mother. Um, we need you to do this. If not for yourself, then for your abuela, do, do it for your granddaddy, do it for your big mama, do it for your pop pop. So it's this very kind of colorful language that um, meant to speak to communities of color. And at the same time, beginning with this statement, avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Well, that's basic public health messaging in general, but it's really individualizing. It's very stigmatizing language and it shifts. It was an early way of trying to explain away, again, the disparities that we were seeing by people's individual behaviors when we know it runs so much deeper than that. Um, and then you have the state senator, who's also a physician, who said, could it just be that African Americans or the colored population do not wash their hands as well as other groups or don't wear masks or don't socially distance themselves? So again, we really, um, we do this work and we do this research because communities know that it's not um, at the individual level, it's not these behavioral explanations that tell us why there's disproportionate COVID rates as much as politicians or others may want to rely on these kinds of old stereotypes to explain those disparities away. But there are structural disparities at every level, even in cities like Detroit, um, at the very fundamental level of access to clean water. So that um, kind of wraps up our presentation. Um, obviously, it comes at this time of COVID-19, um, hopefully a pandemic that is winnowing. Um, but I think if it's OK, um, Amy and Monica and Emily, that we could open up for questions. Um, unless, Emily, you had any final thoughts or wanted to wrap up. No, I think that's great. Thanks, Nadia. Absolutely. Thank you both for presenting. Um, so we do have a few minutes um, and we'll um, open the floor for those of you who are listening for questions, comments. Uh, it's a very um, rich set of data that's been shared by this team um, and really driven by critical research questions uh, that emerged out of what was happening in the community and the, the, um, the experience of community uh, residents. So 
questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or if you want to pop a question into the chat. Um, those are both fair mechanisms. Yeah. Questions or comments? Well, folks are gathering their thoughts. I actually had a question. I, I really appreciate the work you guys did. To, I know that the COVID case rate data has been available at the at a fairly uh, large geographic area. Are those were those zip codes that you guys were presenting that data at? Yeah, um, which makes it kind of hard to parse out you know, what's happening at more of an individual level and make connections. Uh, and I really appreciate the really thoughtful work you did to try to disaggregate what was happening in nursing homes and where those are clustered and where cases were clustered there from what was happening in the population. I had a question about whether you had thought about the possibility of um, of actually looking at case uh, cases of COVID by the population at the zip code level and whether that, you know, just to try to get a sense of the rates um, within those zip codes. Emily, looks like. Yeah, I can actually, Amy, if you want me to, I, we, we did include a map of that in the presentation. Okay, I must have missed it. Um, Thanks. So here, these two maps next to each other, on the left, you're seeing COVID mapped by rate. On the right, you're seeing COVID map by number of cases. So, so that was where we were we were really seeing, you know, the, the the map of the rate was the one that was being circulated widely in the media. Um, that was the one that we were seeing, um, and we realized that it was essentially a map of where nursing homes were located yes. in the city. Um, and so that was that was the impetus for disaggregating that data and trying to get a more kind of granular sense of how it was actually playing out outside of nursing homes. Perfect. Thank you, thank you for that. And I'm sorry I missed it the first time through. Um, we have a question from Marie O'Neill in the chat. Could you provide additional, first great presentation, um, and then could you provide additional information about the challenges you face in obtaining data on shutoffs from the Water Authority and any lessons learned in that process? Yes, do you, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, Emily, what? Um, Yes, we um, our struggles to get data from the water department about shutoffs is a many year saga. Um, we have actually engaged in a lawsuit um, at one point with them to try and get shutoff data. This was back in 2016. Um, it, it's been a pattern of you know unwillingness to release shutoff data. Um, we've also seen um, you know in our FOIA requests um, we we have issued many many FOIA requests for shutoff data in different years, and we've seen them also um, redacting information from those spreadsheets that we need to be able to map the data. Um, and so it's really sharpened I think our skills in terms of crafting. Um, really detailed FOIA requests so that we can get exactly the kind of data that we need. Um, and that's definitely a takeaway is just to kind of develop a familiarity with the data before you request so that you really are not are not sort of being um, kind of given the runaround in terms of what, what what's actually included in that data set. Um, we have been working uh, this past year, we worked with a couple of different legal organizations, including the ACLU. Um, this year, we've also been working with the um, Great Lakes, uh, I'm blanking on the title now. Um, Environmental Law Center. Monica. Yeah, <laughs> Great Lakes Environmental Law Center, which has been really just invaluable in helping us to follow up on those FOIA requests because it really requires quite a lot of persistence. Um, we requested data on water shutoffs um, up to the time that COVID hit the city because we were trying to get actually specific information about where in the city people were did not have access to water when COVID hit. Um, you know, and we know that in Detroit there was this emergency moratorium on shutoffs. And so they 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 you know tried really quickly, maybe over the course of a month, to turn that water back on. Um, but it was kind of too little too late. And that pandemic had already really blown up in the city. And so we we requested in April of 2020. Um, data about where those water shutoffs had happened in the city, and we actually just received it this month. Um, and so <laughs> it was almost a, almost a year of waiting and pestering and requesting, and um, they really dragged their feet. And I think that they're worried about this data, you know, being made public and 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 you know being in the hands of community. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing struggle. And I think there really needs to be a serious effort to increase transparency in our water departments at every, every level. If I could just add one small thing, you know, because I know the focus of the series is on environmental justice and we used, you know, COVID as one way of thinking about structural racism and access to water. Um, obviously Detroit and Flint both speak to how these kinds of urban issues around control over water, public water, municipal water um, relate um, to those histories of structural racism. And, um, but there's also a way in which those urban environmental issues connect to, um, to more rural or more statewide environmental issues. So the issue of transparency made me remember that there is a lot of mis and under reporting about, the, about water quality in general. There are very few chemicals that are really tracked under the Clean Drinking Water, the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, which really focus on lead and copper. Um, and the EPA also has very limited power in terms of um, tracking a lot of the chemicals that run through our water system. And one of them that's of particular concern in Michigan, I'm sure many of you have heard of, is PFAS. And this is, um, you know, the product of, uh, it's an industrial chemical, it's entirely man-made. Um, it's been produced in such high volumes that it's now in almost every living being on the planet. Um, sea mammals as far away as the Arctic oceans have this chemical in their bloodstreams. Um, and it's in very high concentration in Michigan, but without proper tracking, it's only been through community advocacy and a community push to make um, the local health departments and to make the EPA and to make EGLE, the state environmental health authority, look for these chemicals and actually track water quality that we've known anything about how serious of a problem this is. And then there's tens of thousands of chemicals that we don't understand well and that we don't have good tracking around. So um, I think this is another one of how information itself is part of what the, the disparate access to information is part of what sustains health disparities um, and racial disparities in terms of um, water, access to safe and affordable water. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, I just wanna read a, a comment in the chat. It says, thank you as a Flint resident, your findings particularly around waterborne illness make a lot of sense. And then another question, um, it seems like this research couldn't have done, have, have been done um, with, uh, I think without the collaboration of the community. Could you describe how you formed those partnerships and got people to participate? And Monica may wanna weigh in on this one. Just wanted to comment very quickly. I want Emily and Nadia both to weigh in on the latter part of the question. But as it relates to Flint, the research was actually used during the Flint water crisis, the, uh, the task force that took on uh, actually convening around uh, the devastation and the racial inequities that played out around covering up the crime of the Flint water crisis that was reviewed by the Michigan uh, Commission for Human Rights. Uh, actually, our research was used not only by Dr. Peter Hammer, but Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Messenheiser uh, to actually evidence that racial disparity. So this community-driven work has been a critical part uh, throughout uh, Michigan and throughout the nation in, in actually lifting that community voice and making uh, that kind of research relevant in the moment to what's happening to communities. So thank you, Flint. Uh, you've definitely been an amazing partner and making sure that water disparities have, have a face uh, and definitely not letting up until we, uh, we make sure it happens across the nation. But I'll defer to Nadia and Emily on this, the latter part of the question. I can um, begin to try to answer this question. I mean, I think that, um, you know, organizing is really relationship building. And so I know that, you know, we're very indebted to the work that Monica um, and the other founders, the co-founders of We the People of Detroit have done. Um, I know that when we were planning, for example, that um, citywide survey that I talked about where we used the CDC toolkit and organized a lot of volunteers, one of the things we had lots of conversations about was how do we show up at everyone's door, not just as you know people who are extracting information and leaving. And that was really important because that is a legacy that um, made a lot of people, right, not even want to answer the door. And so to be doing that um, research, not as 
Um, but as a community organization that is very committed to this issue, that maintains a lot of respect and integrity in the community around this issue. And that also, for example, we had a whole um, kind of protocol built in where like what happened when we encountered somebody who had their water shut off? Did we just check a box like, oh, you don't have water and leave and count that up? No, you know, we had information, we had kicker cards, our um, volunteers all had numbers where you would call on the spot and not leave until we figured out a way to connect that person to getting their water turned back on. We connected people to the water rights hotline so that they would have water delivered that evening by our same volunteers who were out canvassing and doing research um, to drop off water and make sure that people felt cared for and not just that they were sources of information. And so actually by doing that, there are at least a couple of people that we met along the way who are so interested in our work that they were subjects of the research um, in that public health term. And they actually asked to come volunteer with us and ended up helping in the data analysis and coming to our events and sending out our emails. So um, I think that it's really about the power of relationships and being a trusted partner who is going to stay in the fight um, and actually um, see people through to the other side of what is a very intimate and very serious um, issue. Thank you. Yeah, and I would, I would maybe just add to that, that we also are like operating within the ecosystem of movement organizing in the city of Detroit. And so, you know, we are working in coalition with many other organizations that are advocating for safe and affordable water and for other forms of, you know, justice and increased democratic participation in the city. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's really important to our work that we are, um, tied. We are not working in a silo. We are tied to these other organizations. We're working in solidarity with them. Um, and many of our members are involved in multiple different initiatives in the city. And so we're, we are tied, you know, personally also in many different ways to many different efforts in the city at the same time. Um, and that, that work really comes into our work in many, many different ways. I think that that is a lovely note to end on because it really um, frames, uh, reframes the relationship between researchers and community members um, and represents uh, research that is done in the service of community um, and that is driven by community questions. Monica, I see you unmuted. So I want to just see, did you have a, a last word you wanted to share there? Well, Amy, you know, I wouldn't be a good activist if I didn't give you an action. <laughs> uh, and so I need folks to go to the We The People page. And at the top of the page, you can take the pledge to support water affordability. It is our value system. It's a principle-based framework to really be able to advance water affordability, not only in Detroit, but in Michigan. And we know as goes Michigan, so goes the nation. Uh, so we're inviting folks to be a part of that. And then the second part I would say to you as scholars and people that have a massive network, uh, please deputize yourselves and make sure that folks are pushing because we only have eight days before Michigan does not have any moratorium uh, as it relates to water protection. And so this is not only good for Detroit, this is good for Michigan. And we're just as equally concerned about our rural partners that will not have uh, some covering that they need. Thank you, Monica, and great teamwork. Thank you, Nadia, for putting the link into the chat. So folks who would like to go directly there, I also want to give, uh, I want, first of all, I want to thank this amazing team uh, for sharing some of the incredible work that they've done over the last few years around water access and its importance to public health and health equity. Um, thank you for making time. I know you guys had a really big day yesterday, um, and we really appreciate you coming around the table again today. Just a quick plug, um, this team put together an incredible webinar yesterday called De Democratizing Water Affordability, a discussion on structural racism and residential segregation across America. Monica has promised me it will be posted to her website soon. Uh, they're working on it now, and I encourage um, those of you who are interested to go go uh, listen in on that really powerful set of presentations. And I wouldn't be a good organizer. Monica, thank you for that. Uh, if I didn't also give a, a shout out to the, the, um, the, the coming up um, presentations in this series. So next week we have a presentation by Marie O'Neill and Zachary Rowe on climate hazards, housing and health in Detroit. Please join us at this same time. 
On April 13th, we have a session on environmental racism and environmental justice that will be presented by two members of our stakeholder advocacy board, Donnell Wilkins and Catherine Savoy. Um, and just a, a little teaser to note that both Donnell and Catherine were part of the first people of color environmental justice summit that happened in Washington, DC and kicked off our contemporary environmental justice movement. They're a powerful team. And then finally, on April 20th, we'll have a presentation that includes myself, Stuart Batterman, and Angela Reyes from uh, Detroit Hispanic Development Coalition talking about community action to promote healthy environments, research to improve air quality and health in Detroit. So thank, uh, thank you all once again for joining us for this session. Thank you, and yes, and thank you, Monica, Emily, and Nadia um, for, your, for your work. Um, and your and bringing bring in your willingness to share it with us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Great job, team.